Welcome everybody. My name is Mike Martin. Welcome to another Casio Artist Spotlight. We have a very exciting guest coming up in just a couple minutes. But first, as always, I want to introduce, introduce one of my co-hosts for today's show. Joining me 890 miles to my east, Mr. Rich Formidoni. How are you doing today, Rich? Doing pretty good, Mike. Thank you very much. You and I have had a crazy week, and it is awesome to be finishing up with the most fun part of the week by far. Absolutely. I think maybe we just need to make these all on Fridays because you know when, when we're done with this, the weekend is almost there. It's fantastic. Not a bad plan. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. But also joining us today, and he actually has appeared himself on one of these artist spotlights previously, Mr. Anthony Patterson. How you doing today, Anthony? Hey, Michael. Hey, hey Rich. This is neat to be on this side of it. This is kind of <laughs> cool. All it uh, takes is one appearance, and then you're in the director's <laughs> chair. <laughs> well, thanks for the inclusion. <laughs> awesome. All right. So our guest today, someone very, very special, uh, and a friend of of Mr. Patterson. So, uh, without further ado, let's let's dive in and introduce him, Dr. Everett McCorvey. He's a tenor soloist. He's a conductor and a professor of voice. He's also the founder and music director of the American Spiritual Ensemble, the director and executive producer of the University of Kentucky Opera Theater, president of the Global. Creative Connections, and my goodness, this is a mouthful. <laughs> and all, most importantly, the Artistic Director of the National Chorale. Welcome to our broadcast, Dr. Everett McCorvey. How are you today? I'm well, and thank you so much for having me. What a joy to be on, and what an honor to be uh, to be on with you all. So it's, it's great to be here. Uh, the honor is definitely ours. Thank you very much for making the time for us today. Oh, thank you, Rich. Uh, great. So I great want to remind see. everybody, uh, we do have a, a live chat view, so if you have questions for Dr. McCorvey, we, we will see those on the chat screen, so if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, uh, please participate with us today. Of course, we have some questions, and I guess I'm going to get started with the first one. Um, Everett, what was your first musical influence? Well, my first musical influence was I was probably in the second grade and I grew up in Montgomery, Alabama, and uh, I grew up doing the civil rights movement, actually. Uh, Martin Luther King lived about, gosh, two blocks from my house. Uh, and uh, the civil rights movement was uh, in full swing. My father was a deacon at the church where the Reverend Raph David Abernathy was the minister. And so music was a, a, a very big part of the civil rights movement. And, uh, but I also lived close to a local uh, college, a uh, historically black college called Alabama State at the time, it was called Alabama State Teachers College, and uh, now it's Alabama State University. And of course, you may uh, a lot of people know them because of the wonderful Hornets marching band that performs at uh, not only uh, the football games but also at pro games. And they are they're in that category with Grambling and you know and all of those bands. Anyway we used to house young men who went to school at Alabama State uh, Teachers College. And one of the young men played the trumpet and uh, he played in the band. I was in the second grade and uh, I heard him play the trumpet and I thought that it was the sweetest music I had ever heard in my life. <laughs> And so I talked to my dad and I said, Dad, I would love to learn how to play the trumpet. Well, now, OK, I'm in the second grade, about to go to the third grade. Right. So my dad said, OK, son. So he took takes me down to the local uh, music store and we rent a trumpet. And because uh, I think my dad thinks, you know, he's not going to keep this up. Well, uh, we rent the trumpet, and then uh, my dad says, uh, well, son, would you like to take trumpet lessons? And I said, yes. So he goes to the local uh, black high school, which was right up the street from my house, Booker T. Washington High School, and the band director there was a man by the name of Mr. Ellis. I still remember all these things. And uh, so 
he arranged for a trumpet lesson with Mr. Ellis. And so we both went up and, and it was a Monday and I had my trumpet lesson and I call it a life changing experience for both of us because after that lesson, I knew that being in music was what I wanted to do. And after that lesson, later on that afternoon, Mr. Ellis died. Oh, oh whoa. Wow. And so I thought, oh, no, I have killed him with my trumpet. <laughs> 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 and it was just a sort of a stressful experience. But, you know, my dad was great. He took me through the whole, you know, process. We went to the funeral home and saw Mr. Ellis all laid up in his coffin. And, you know, and so after the funeral, my dad asked me if, if you know, he wa if I wanted him to find someone else to um, teach me trumpet. And I said, well, no, dad, I, I don't want to kill somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I taught myself how to play trumpet. And so when I joined the band in the third grade, uh, I was one of two elementary school kids in the high school band. And, uh, and so my first experiences in music was through playing the trumpet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I eventually played, uh, sang in choir in my church. And, uh, and I played in the band through my first year of college at the University of Alabama. So I was in the wow. million dollar band uh, there when Bear Bryant was still the coach. Okay. And uh, so we had a great experience there. But then I started singing and, um, uh, and found that my sort of my career path was going to be through singing. And uh, so, you know, you never know, what, you know, once you start. But uh, I didn't have my first voice lesson until I was in college. And uh, but in college, I knew two things that I wanted to pursue a career as a singer and also a career as a conductor. And so, you know, I'm happy to say that, you know, both of those things uh, panned out. Wow. You That's answered wonderful. the first four questions we had lined up. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> You know, right that's why I ask you how long was this program? <laughs> <laughs> that was fantastic. <laughs> wow, because you answered the ones? trumpet question, you answered the civil rights question, and um, <laughs> I'll skip to one more, and and maybe Rich can find figure out where we're going from here. <laughs> <laughs> so when did when did when did piano become part of your your musical path? Well, I you know when I was in uh, again when I was a child and you know we think about these things now and I bet all of us have experiences like this where we uh, we start off on one path and we never really realize the importance of people who guided us through uh, to different opportunities. Right. And uh, my mother thought it was really important that I take piano. And so even before I took trumpet, I started piano oh, just okay. as early as I could uh, uh, speak. I mean, and I remember my piano teacher's name, Mrs. Percival, and uh, she was down the street. And, uh, but, uh, so I started taking piano lessons, gosh, I don't know how old I was, but I bet it was, you know, maybe six or seven right. uh, right. years old. And uh, just to make sure, you you didn't kill Miss Percival, did no, you? No, I didn't kill Miss Percival. <laughs> Thank right. goodness. And frankly, I, I I mean, I'm not sure of this, but I think Miss Percival is still alive. So I think she's like over a hundred by now. But immortal. Uh, <laughs> But uh, it really gave me a love for piano and, um, and an understanding that every musician uh, has the piano as sort of their mother instrument. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was working with a student just uh, yesterday and I was uh, encouraging her to not be afraid of the piano, I said, because, you know, our job is to have that relationship with the mother instrument. And, uh, and that's in piano. And that, it doesn't matter what uh, career in music that you go into, what part of the career you go into in music, you have to have that relationship with the piano. You don't have to be a Van Cliburn uh, or an Anthony Patterson, but uh, 
<laughs> but you have to have that relationship because it it takes over and it's a part of everything uh, that we do. And yeah, we refer to it as the gateway instrument from time to time. You know? yes. That's yeah. a great way. I'll, uh, if you don't mind, I'll steal that because that's a great <laughs> way of saying it. I mean, it really is. And so, you know, if you're going to be a serious musician or if you're, you know, even if you're not going to be serious and do it as a hobby, uh, the piano is still a part of our, our lives. Dr. McCorvey. Yes, sir. <laughs> so I know, I know. Everett, as a performer, you have you have done so many things. You you've traveled all over the world. You performed at the Met, and you've also been part of some really incredible uh, productions and performances. Do any of these stand out as milestones? Oh my goodness, that's a great question. Uh, because really, I have so many uh, milestones, and I feel very fortunate to have had so many experiences. Especially, you know, uh, a young African American kid coming from Montgomery, Alabama, where you know I had no, if it were not for my parents, in terms of them, they were not musicians, uh, but they share the their love of music with me and, uh, and and when they found out that I had some of these talents they gave me the opportunities and I know that there are a lot of kids out there who don't have these opportunities and uh, that's something I'd love to get into with you with Casio because I think that what you all are doing to offer uh, kids and schools around the country the opportunity to introduce music to them by what you're doing with your pianos. It's, it's quite amazing. Um, but, you know, I can probably think of every uh, everything that I've been a part of from uh, conducting to singing at the Met um, uh, to, you know, teaching some, you know, wonderful students uh, forming the American Spiritual Ensemble. And in in each one of those instances, I've had sort of a, an experience that, that has um, uh, been meaningful to me. The opening night of the Metropolitan Opera, uh, I was in the production of Porgy and Bess at the Met. Uh, the opening night was in 1984, and that was the first time the Met had uh, presented Porgy and Bess. And uh, the, there were about 88 debuts in that uh, production in 1984. And uh, it was, and to be a part of that, Grace Bumbry was the best and mm -hmm. Simon Estes was the porgy. Wow. And, um, you know, when Grace Bumbry walked out on stage for her curtain call, confetti just mm -hmm. rained down from the, oh, the rafters <laughs> in the Met. And it's, it's, it's one of the moments that I will never uh, forget in my, in my life. And, uh, wow. and, and, and so that was, a, also in that production, I, I met my wife and, uh, Alicia was also, uh, we were both in the chorus and, uh, uh, she never met a Southerner, I think, and, uh, <laughs> she was a New Yorker and, uh, you know, I said to her probably a a few weeks after we had been dating, you must come to Alabama. And uh, she was thinking in her mind, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But, you know, 30, 34 years later, we are still, you know, we're still married and uh, enjoying life. So uh, The Met was a huge production. Uh, Porgy and Bess has been a, a very important part of my, my musical journey. Uh, I've probably been a part of, gosh, I stopped counting at about 600 performances. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, uh, it's been a big part of my life. And, uh, but it's offered so many opportunities for so many uh, singers of color. And it's been another gateway and in entrance uh, into opera companies. And of course, the Met uh, remounted it, uh, remount, um, 
mounted a new another production of Corey and Bess just this past season that was a huge success. And uh, so I think that finally Porgy and Bess is in the repertory to stay. That's wonderful. Amazing. Wow. So, I mean, it, it's got to be a lot more than 600 because 500 of those performances alone were with the American Spiritual Ensemble, which <laughs> you're, you're the founder and musical director of, of that group. So yeah. how did that come to be? Well, uh, this year we're celebrating our 25th anniversary of the American Spiritual Ensemble. And uh, luckily, we got the major part of our tour uh, in this year, right before uh, the shutdown on March 13th because of COVID. I think our last performance of the tour, of this first part of our tour, was in March, March 11th. Uh, but um, I guess, well, it was 25 years ago uh, when I started the group. And the reason I started it is because I grew up on spirituals. I grew up hearing spirituals uh, in Montgomery, Alabama, during the civil rights movement. I, Martin Luther King was a lover of spirituals and used them a lot in his uh, sermons and the text, used the text from spirituals. And when I got out of college and started uh, performing professionally, what I noticed was that uh, a lot of people didn't know the difference between spirituals and gospel music. Mm -hmm. And so gospel music was, of course, blossoming and becoming a multi-billion dollar industry. And the traditional Negro spirituals were being lost. And so I wanted to make sure that the spirituals had their own place in the American musical uh, repertory. And so I called a few of my friends and uh, explained to them my desire to start a group. Uh, I used some of my students from the university and, and between my professional friends and some of my graduate students, I started the American Spiritual Ensemble and um, very quickly it developed into uh, a big touring group. And so I was no longer able to use my students because they had to be in class. And uh, <laughs> so uh, I went to a full professional group and uh, now I hold auditions in New York uh, yearly and uh, in the, in the, the group tours throughout the year. And uh, it has been a great joy to me and because I've wanted to make sure that spirituals had their own place uh, and were not just lumped in with other uh, types of music, uh, of, you know, from the African-American um, uh, repertory. So we have a clip from Great God Almighty. That's that's this oh. this ensemble. Yeah, that's right. All yeah. right. So how about that? Let's take a quick listen. course that's just a small clip from that piece but absolutely amazing sounding group my goodness <laughs> well that was from the american choral directors association uh, eastern regional conference this past uh, in in this past march actually and uh, 
So that was a, a, great, a great group. We have about 125 singers on our roster, and, uh, but we travel with between 20 and 25 singers. Um, and typically, if you've been on one tour, you get the first right of refusal for the next tour. And then if you're not available, then I go to the roster to pull uh, another like, L-I-K-E, voice to be a part of the ensemble. Amazing. I, <laughs> that's absolutely 500 performances too. Wow. <laughs> Can't imagine. So um, how, uh, how and when did you meet our friend Anthony over here? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> We have had the great pleasure, I had the great pleasure of being invited to be a part of the Bayview Music Festival in uh, Michigan. And uh, I had sent, I, I, I would normally send students to Bayview and uh, because it's a wonderful festival for young students who are interested in pursuing a career in the business and wanting to see how they, so, sort of how they stand on a national level. And uh, the Bayview Music Festival is a very welcoming, very supportive environment for students who have, uh, you, you can have different um, lengths of programs. Some programs are three week, five weeks, six weeks, some programs are one week, but they asked me to do a, a a program on the American Negro Spirituals Intensive, where I would bring young people from around the country to work on spirituals and uh, to help them with the understanding and the performance of spirituals. And so, um, so when I was there, I had the opportunity uh, to uh, meet and work with uh, uh, Tony and uh, his wife, Casey Robards, they are both amazing uh, artists and pianists, as you know. And it's been a wonderful uh, experience. I think it's been maybe six years, Tony. I can't. I can't. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. And, uh, and so as a result, uh, I've had other opportunities. For instance, uh, I did a Carmina Burana at uh, Lincoln Center in New York with mm -hmm. the National Chorale. Uh, and uh, I invited Tony to be one of the, uh, we, we were doing the, the, the arrangement with two pianists and a large um, on, percussion ensemble. And I invited Tony to be one of the pianists and he was just amazing. And <laughs> As it so often is. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And, uh, and then this year, Casey, was a part, uh, she came out for a few weeks of the American Spiritual Ensemble tour. So basically I try to hire them and engage them whenever I can. Mm -hmm. And uh, my next job is to try to get them to move to my city so that uh, <laughs> we can collaborate a little more. <laughs> well, Tony, we're very grateful that, uh, that you introduced Everett to us as well. So thank yeah. you for that. Uh, you mentioned Casey. Casey is actually contributing some really good questions here. And Casey, oh, I'm going to I'm going to break this up into multiple parts here. All uh, right. What recommendations would you give to aspiring musicians? What is essential for having a career in music? It's a big question. It, it's a big question, and I will tell you exactly what I uh, say to my students. I basically tell them if they can do anything else, do it. <laughs> and but, <laughs> but if they must sing, if they must be in the performance uh, arena, come in with that level of commitment because that's what it's going to take. Mm. You have to want to do this more than anything else in the world. Uh, you don't do this because of money. You don't do this because you're seeking fame and fortune. You do this because you have to. And it's calling you. It's really like a ministry in any, a lot of ways where you might hear a minister say that they were called to be a minister. Mm -hmm. I think musicians are called the same way. And there is nothing else in the world that you can do uh, that gives you the same level of satisfaction and will to want to make a difference in the community. 
And so, so I tell students, if they're going to be in the performing arena, to come in at the level that this is what I want to do more than anything else. Then as you're working in, you know, working in the trenches and doing all the difficult things that we've all had to do in order to make a career out of this, it doesn't feel like work. You know, I tell students I'm still waiting to work my first day because I get to go to my office and to my studio and I get to make music and I get to have fun and I get to create and I get to try to offer something special to my community, to uh, the industry, uh, to the world through the gifts that I um, that I was given and through the gift that I was giving, given. And so that's something that I try to uh, impart on all of the students to, mm -hmm. to have a, you know, make sure that you want to do this more than anything else in the world. I think that's a fantastic answer. And you certainly are gifted. And one of the most remarkable aspects about that is your proficiency across so many different musical genres. Mm -hmm. Is there is there a specific type of music that resonates most with you or that you find most rewarding? Uh, I like it all, you know. Uh, I can't remember <laughs> if it was Bernstein or who was it that made the quote, it's all music. I can't remember who it was, but mm -hmm. uh, that's a famous quote from someone. And, uh, but I feel like it's all music. And uh, I am blessed to be at a university. I'm, I'm a professor of voice and uh, director of opera at the University of Kentucky. And I've, I've been, it's been a place that's been very nurturing for me in terms of allowing me to pursue all of my interests, uh, not only from uh, building uh, uh, an opera program uh, and producing a lot of great, great operas from world premieres to a lot of the standards, um, but also to go out and perform with the American Spiritual Ensemble and take the, the history and the story uh, and the importance of that music to our American musical culture, take that to the world. Uh, and also with the National Chorale in New York City, I'm, this, I'm in my sixth year as the artistic director of the National Chorale. Mm -hmm. And I actually, when I was in New York freelancing, I was actually a member of the chorale. And uh, so it's sort of like full circle now that I'm going back to be the, that I'm there as the artistic uh, director. And so I get to, I get to work in classical music in just so many forms. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's been a real uh, blessing. And it's something that I try to teach my students, which is, you know, we were all given a lot of different gifts. And um, if you're gonna focus on one gift, then just make sure it's the best thing out there. But a lot of us have talents in several different areas. And so what I try to do with my students is encourage them to pursue all of their gifts because you never know which one uh, the door will open to. And uh, I guess I've been you know, blessed to, to feel like several of those doors have uh, have opened um, in in these different areas, and and you know I'm very humble. I'm very humbled by that, and I try to make sure that I never uh, take these gifts for granted, and uh, I, I try to make sure that I do my part to be prepared for any uh, opportunity that I'm afforded. That's fantastic, and you actually answered Casey's second question in there too. <laughs> <laughs> We're just knocking them out here, guys. Uh, do any no. uh, specific exciting uh, moments uh, come to mind from your time uh, at the at the university? Well, uh, again, I um, you know I took over an an opera program that had a very small uh, budget and basically you know built a program that you know has a budget of you know, almost $10 million for opera. And, uh, and we are able to produce opera at a very, very high level. And, um, and, and, and 
it, it's been from a supportive administration that I've had here at UK. And so lots of great uh, experiences uh, produced. We, do, we produce a, a summer show called It's a Grand Night for Singing, and it's a big Broadway review. And, you know, we sell almost 10,000 tickets for that and uh, over a few weekends. And, you know, that's been great because, again, it gives our students the opportunity uh, to sing musical theater in the summer while they're singing opera during uh, the year. And so it just opens up their their world in terms of the possibilities for their for their future uh, work. And, uh, and, and, you know, every day I get to come in and work with, well, not now during COVID, I, we do it over Zoom, but, you know, getting to come in to work with some really stellar talents from around the world. And um, it, it is really, you know, I, I feel very hopeful for, for our business in terms of the students that we're putting out uh, who will, you know, be the leaders in, uh, in the world in, in the next few years. And so, so it's very exciting for me. So I, I look forward to coming to work every day. Wow. It's the ultimate version of paying it forward. That's exactly right. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> That's great. I'm yeah, just, looking. I was looking at the chat. My goodness. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so many nice compliments. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you're also an advisor and panelist, among everything else, for the National Endowment of the Arts. Um, yes. So can you tell us a little bit about your involvement with that organization, and sure. how do you think other musicians should get involved with organizations such as that? Um, I have been. Uh, uh, and it, on the advisory panel for the National Endowment for the Arts for a while. That started back in the, um, gosh, I think it was early 90s, I guess. Um, and uh, one of the things that happens there is uh, some of the uh, panelists will go out and review uh, opera companies and write reports to the endowment. And I had the great pleasure, uh, this was a few years ago, of visiting most of the major young artist programs in the country and writing reviews, they, artist companies that had applied for grants to the NEA and then writing uh, assessments of what was going on in those programs. And it was amazing to see the work that is going on around the country uh, in opera. You know, it used to be when I was coming up in the, you know, 80s, 70s and 80s, and even into into the, the 90s, if you wanted to have an international opera career, you had to go to Europe and you had to make a you had to make a impression in Europe and then come back to the United States. But now, because of all of the uh, young artist programs that are happening in opera around the United States, now students don't have to go to Europe in order to you know make a mark and then come back. You can actually rise up through uh, young artist programs here in the United States. And so, so that's one thing that I would encourage people to do is uh, really take advantage of the opportunities. And if you're not sure what's happening in your particular city, then I would suggest that you go to your arts council. Almost every city has some sort of arts council. And arts councils are the grassroots organization uh, of the National Endowment for the Arts. And so, because a lot of money that comes from the National Endowment for the Arts is funded through local arts companies, arts councils. And so, you know, just look up where the arts councils are in your city and go and meet with them and talk about the opportunities for artists in that particular city. That's exactly what I did mm -hmm. when I was coming out of college. I went to my local arts council, the Alabama State Arts Council, and they were extremely helpful in terms of uh, telling me, helping me to find out what my next step was. My next step was to go to Atlanta. There was a, there's a Southern Arts Exchange, which is a larger uh, form of the Arts Council, and they helped me to learn how to market myself as an artist, to go and represent myself at different arts conferences, 
And before I knew it, I was making connections with people all over the country. And it was through the Arts Council. So then when, uh, as I went on up and started working with the NEA, I was able then to also encourage more people to really take advantage of what's happening in their local, uh, uh, with their local Arts Council. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad we asked you about that because uh, up until now, we've never had an artist describe that kind of experience. And I think that's oh, well. incredibly important for people to know. Thank you. Well, a lot of people not, are not sure. You know, it's not like, you know, if, you, if, you are, if you're going into law, you graduate, you pass the bar, you become a lawyer. You know, or if you're getting an MBA, you know, you get your MBA and, you know, you go out and apply. It's not that way with artists. You know, we have to... One of the phrases that I use is creative self-promotion. We have to promote ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you can't be afraid to do that. You can't be too shy to do that because, mm -hmm. you know, you've been given this amazing gift. And uh, it's not for you to go in some room and just, you know, keep it there. It's to share with the world. And, and, and so a lot of times we don't have those access points to where we can get out and 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 display our talents for to others so that others can then help us to go to the next levels. And I have found that uh, the arts councils have been tremendous in terms of helping uh, artists to learn about the possibilities of what's out there in the arts for them. That is fantastic. Absolutely. And I'm going to go straight from that to this question that came in on the chat. A uh, really great question from um, Annie Marie Burke um, asking any tips for college or newly graduated students as we set up and practice in our apartments, dorms and temporary dwellings. Something we've all been experiencing the last six months. Well, I know. And that's, you know, that's really a big challenge for a lot of the students coming out of college right now. What's my next step? And uh, again, I think the first thing to do is to not be afraid to promote your, your, your art form. What I'm telling my students is that I want them to come out of COVID with a long list of things that they said they accomplished during COVID. And then, you know, what are these things? Do I need a website? If I don't have a website, we've been, you know, held up now for how many months? So build a website, you know, I need to redo my resume. You can do that, you know, probably safely distanced. You could even get some uh, new headshots. You know, what's your list of things that you've done? I need to learn a recital. I think I'll take this time during COVID and learn a recital. I mean, find these COVID activities that you can create so that then when you come out of COVID, you're ready to go. You know, my wife is a singer and a dancer and she takes at least two dance classes a day. <laughs> and uh, from Alvin Ailey Dance, from Broadway Dance Centers, all of these dance companies are offering dance classes and they're, you know, very inexpensive. So what happens if a singer is a great actor, but they're not a great dancer? Well, guess what? You could be taking dance classes. Right. You know, you know, there's so many things that you can do. And so that you're not just sitting on the couch saying, oh, well, it's me, as we're all going through this difficult time of COVID. That answer was gold. <laughs> Pure inspiration right there. So you, you mentioned not being afraid of self-promotion. So how are you? Oh, there you go. The Look. <laughs> I want a shirt. I want you to send me one. <laughs> at some point, we got to get around to the the, the Casio let's, stuff. Let's let's Are go you... there because we're we're at forty minutes in. Right. Well, I'll tell you. I don't know. Uh, I I had a really wonderful experience with Casio the other day because, uh, of course, when all of this came and I had to go, we all had to go into the teaching mode of working at home. You know. Your, your piano is so portable and, you know, it's the weighted keys are wonderful and, uh, and all of the multifunctional things that they can do. So, you know, I was able to just put the Casio piano under my arm and take it to my home 
create a studio there and teach there. And then I had a rehearsal over here for an upcoming Christmas show. Imagine rehearsing Christmas in October. But I'm not ready. <laughs> that's what we're doing. So, uh, you know, my, stu- my, my rehearsal hall is only, you know, because of COVID, I can only get like 12 people in there at a time. So I have a huge lawn. And so outside of my building, so I took the, the Casio and I took it right outside and I put it on a stand and we had rehearsal outside in the beautiful, beautiful um, uh, fall uh, air. And so, you know, that's one of the things I really love about it is that, you know, it's not, you know, 200 pounds and difficult to move. Uh, it's very easy to move and it w- it just worked so well for me. And so I've been encouraging, you know, all of my students and parents who are always asking me about what type of instrument to purchase for their uh, students. I've been suggesting Casio and uh, I'll send them to Mike and uh, I mean, uh, to Tony and uh, Tony uh, hooks them up with uh, the right model based on their needs. Uh, my neighbor next door, her COVID activity was writing a Broadway show. Yeah. And uh, so I described what she needed to uh, Tony and Tony was able to suggest two or three different possibilities for them. And they went out uh, and purchased it and, you know, enjoying it. So, uh, you know, Cassio has really been a, a wonderful godsend for us during this time. That's oh. wonderful. Fantastic. Our, our pleasure. And and uh, I think you're using a, a Privia PXS 1000 is the one I think you have. Which yes. Is, uh, they're just, they're incredibly small. It's really unbelievable. And yeah, Casey mm-hmm. mentioned in the chat as you were talking, the battery power and being able to, you know, to take them outside on a, on a fall day like we're having lately and, and enjoy some fresh air before, before winter comes, you know. And it's a, it's a great way to safely experience music, not only by yourself, but with, with other people. It's amazing. Well, I think that, uh, and we're starting to see more and more of this, and I think we will see even more people becoming very creative in terms of how they oh, yeah. are delivering music uh, during uh, COVID. And, uh, and, and, and like I was saying earlier, you know, we do music, I'm sure all of us on this little chat room, we're doing music because we have to. We love it. We want to do it more than anything else. And so COVID is just, you know, providing us with other opportunities to be creative so that we can find ways to make music happen. And so what you offer with Casio is you offer a way for us to find that creativity so that we can take an instrument that sounds legit and sounds big and and has all of these you know major functions and so we don't have to worry about those sort of things when we are are working in our creative uh mindset and so uh that's really been a blessing Everett, I mean, I, this has been just such an amazing discussion with you. I can't thank you enough. I mean, can we do this once a week? <laughs> <laughs> My, I don't know. You might get tired of me. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I, so, I mean, r- real quick, I mean, how how has all of this affected your teaching? I mean, you're teaching from home. You've got the piano at home. Uh, yeah. I mean, explain to us a day in the life of, of Everett in, in this, this current situation. I think one of the things that probably all of the people who are teaching in this manner will probably uh, respond to is that uh, an hour of teaching is a long time on, on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. you know uh, I think, you know, I, so we have 45 minute uh, lessons on Zoom, and uh, and that has worked really well because then you can get a little rest and you know not so much eye fatigue. But you know I can still teach six or eight lessons uh, during the, the the day and and uh, and and still 
offer an educational experience and content for our students. And then for our large rehearsals, what I've been doing uh, is I will have a rehearsal in, like for our Christmas program, we would either have them outside with all of the students using the Casio, or what I would do inside is I would have maybe 12 in the rehearsal room and the rest of the students on Zoom. And so each rehearsal, I rotate who's live in the room, and then I use the people who are, you know, and then they they are able to access the Zoom. You know, part of the problem, as we've talked about, and I'm sure it, if it's not Casio, it'll be somebody, but it may be Casio that comes up with how to fix the latency issue. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's a problem. Yeah. It's a because it, that's the big challenge. And so going, you know, sometimes you have to look at another way to uh, deliver the audio portion of the of the lesson. But, you know, people are making strides every day in terms of figuring out, especially if we're going to be in this mode for a while. Right. I think uh, people are making strides every day in figuring out how what's the best way to deliver uh, the uh, the content. And so I think more and more people will begin to come out a little more and rehearse a little more as they are finding ways uh, to deliver that content. But for this fall, the, uh, the Casio has been tremendous. Awesome. We are so glad we could help. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. This is awesome. Yeah, this has been an amazing discussion, Everett, and we can't thank you enough for your time. I, you know, we we may have to revisit this sooner rather than later because this was just amazing. I think also just inspiring for for a lot of people, including including us. So very well, much so. Uh, yes, in fact, and you. we didn't get to the, back to the question about um, a basketball opera that Casey mentioned <laughs> earlier. So we definitely have to do this again. That's right. Bounce the basketball opera. Yeah. <laughs> at we, UK. At UK, you know, UK is the Mecca for basketball. So <laughs> we have to have an opera and we created one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we will have to, we'll, we'll revisit that perhaps on, on part two of, of this interview because, uh, <laughs> wow. Um, Everybody's commenting in the chat, lots of thumbs up and likes, and everybody's saying this has been wonderful. And so, and again, we couldn't agree more. So, on behalf of all of us at Casio and everyone watching, Everett, thank you so much for spending this time with us. And uh, I have put your website up on the screen for everybody to, you know, please go visit uh, Everett's website, learn more about what he's doing, check that out online, follow him everywhere. So. <laughs> well, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the platform and thanks for all that you do. Uh, I just am so impressed with uh, what Casio is bringing to not only educational institutions, but communities around the country in making the, the ability to play piano accessible. And uh, it's going to change a lot of lives. So uh we're 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 very appreciative about all that right. all right well to say goodbye here we have a little bit of a brady bunch theme going here so everett you're on my left and tony or rich is down here so everybody just look around <laughs> and wave goodbye <laughs> all right <laughs> thanks everybody we'll and we will see you next time on our next casio artist spotlight thanks again take care thank you very much <laughs>